Today, I'm going to share with you four secret reasons children could grow up feeling scared of their parents and how to turn it around. I've been wanting to do this podcast episode for a long time because after talking to 14,000 parents, I notice among all of them that the most common fear they have is I don't want my children to be scared of me. So on this episode, you are going to learn what those four secret things are and how to turn it around if you are finding yourself there. And as well, it's going to give you reassurance if you are doing things great. And sometimes maybe you are not giving yourself a lot of credit. It's going to give you peace of mind and a lot of clarity. Hello, welcome to the Parenting with Understanding podcast. This is your host, Marcela Collier. I'm a certified parenting coach and founder of HIC Parenting Education Agency. My team of coaches and I have helped 14,151 clients and customers go from a lot of frustration and overwhelm raising their sensitive children, their neurodivergent children, to feeling more at ease raising their kids. And today I'm going to share with you four secret reasons on why kids, especially sensitive and neurodivergent kids, could grow up feeling scared of their parents. So let's talk about these hidden reasons. Reason number one is inconsistent reactions. I call these the pendulum pattern. And if you find yourself in one of these four reasons, don't beat yourself up. It's not about us becoming perfect parents. We all make mistakes. An important thing is to gain awareness so we can course correct. Inconsistent reactions or the pendulum parenting pattern, I call it pendulum because the child bounces back and forth between feeling connected, seen, understood. Maybe uh, I grew up feeling this way. I grew up in a pendulum pattern. When my mom saw me crying, perhaps sad, she was reassuring, nurturing, understanding. She wiped my tears. She was pretty good and I felt safe crying with her. And at the other side, when I was in my sad, angry energy, because one thing that I have to say, anger is just a way the children have to cover all their tender emotions that they don't have an explanation for. So that anger could be really covering disappointment, grief, letdown, jealousy, anxiety, fear. When I showed my fear, anxiety, disappointment, especially growing up as an undiagnosed autistic girl, sometimes it showed up in the form of aggressive behaviors, maybe yelling on the top of my lungs, maybe having a meltdown in the middle of aisle six uh, at my local supermarket. And on those moments, that's when I saw the other side of my parents, especially my mom. She was my primary caregiver. My dad was an uninvolved father. I mean, he brought the, the money to the house, but in, in terms of childcare, my mom did all the heavy lifting with my brother and I. And that's those moments, those, those were the moments where I saw the other, the other side of the coin, the coin. The mom, the yelling mom, the not understanding mom, the mom uh, telling me to, to stop it or else. So it was the same feeling, fear, sadness, disappointment. But if I showed it, it through a tender emotion, like sadness and crying right away, I got the understanding mom. But when I show that very tender emotion in a more aggressive way, then I got the other side of the pendulum. So I was going back and forth between understanding 
and not understanding, feeling loved and connected and not feeling loved and connected. Many other times I felt reactivity from, from my mom, not necessarily for me doing something wrong or a big mistake, but if she woke up at the wrong side of the bed, or if she had an argument with my dad, or if it was just a, a hard day for her, she was on her period, or I don't know, um, then I saw the other side, the short temper, the, the snappy mom, the, the perhaps yelling mom. So inconsistent reactions creates insensitive kids and neurodivergent kids a hypervigilance, a hypervigilance nervous system. Like we, did you feel that growing up that you were kind of walking on eggshells? Things were looking peaceful. They were looking, apparently they were peaceful. There was nothing going around, but you felt uneasy. That's because of growing up in a consistent, inconsistent environment. So how to turn it around? How to turn it around? You turn it around by providing consistent responses to your children, regardless of their behaviors and regardless of what's going on in your life. Now, I understand that you're not a robot. It's not about not feeling frustrated. It's not about not feeling angry with your kids. It's about remaining safe. Okay. Yes, I am frustrated because I've told you multiple times to put your shoes on, but how am I going to show up that frustration? Am I going to show up that frustration in a scary way or in a safe way? So this is how you heal a pendulum pattern. And this is specifically what we work with parents in parenting coaching to become a stable person or not person, parent. To become a stable person that no matter the child's feelings or reaction and no matter what's going around in your life, even no matter what you're feeling, you are able to consciously choose and make the, the, the response, give the, your child the response that they need at that moment to feel connected, to feel seen, um, for the behavior to improve. One example is the story of Bo, she's one of our coaching clients. And when she started providing that consistent, that consistency in her responses to her child, that's when things started to turn around with her. And we did it in a span of a, a few months with her in coaching. And see, this is what she's saying now. I didn't want to raise a quote unquote snowflake. And I didn't want to fall into quote unquote permissive parenting, but I, I can say from experience that when you stick to it, you, you start to see the changes happening, like right in front of you. You start seeing the changes happening right in front of you. And I wanted to show you her testimonial because that's exactly what she said is what keeps us in the pendulum pattern our fear of not raising a strong, confident child, our fear of raising a snowflake, our fear of not raising a good person is what keeps, keeps us in this reactivity pattern. We see, maybe we see the sadness through aggression and we're like, oh no, I don't want my child to be this way. And we react and snap. When in reality, it's just the child struggling to cope with their big emotions. If you have a sensitive child, they feel their emotions very deeply and they could be confused or labeled as well as strong-willed kids. My child is a strong-willed. Everything is a no and he refuses to do things and he drags his heels to, to, to listen when in reality, there is a lot of, a lot of emotions that are playing a part on your child or the child not maybe not putting their shoes on. I was one of those children growing up as an undiagnosed autistic girl. Many things may, gave me a lot of anxiety. The biggest one for me was car rides. And every time I... <laughs> I went on a car, I, like my parents told me to get in a car, it was a struggle. 
and they thought I was stalling. They thought I was just giving them a hard time, but you were okay five minutes ago. You're just giving us a hard time. How come you're saying you have a stomachache now and that's why you cannot go in the car? Listen to your child. Listen to what's beneath their demand, what's beneath their defensiveness, because beneath it there are tender emotions and possible fears that have not been addressed. So let's go to number two. Number two secret reason why kids could grow up feeling scared of their care parents and how to fix it is unintended postures. Sensitive kids in general are very aware of their environment. Why? Because the environment, a lot of the times, feels very overwhelming to them or feels very unsure and scary to them. So they scan the environment, they scan your behaviors, they scan your attitude, they scan your posture. So many times, maybe not too many times, but quite a few times, my autistic son have looked at me and said, hey, why did you do that? You just took a deep breath. Are you, what's happening there? And then I've talked to parents who, who've experienced those kind of behaviors from their kids. I, my kids, they ask me if I'm angry. They're asking me if, like, uh, are you sad? Are you angry? Are you, uh, how are you going? Be happy, mom. And then uh, they say that they feel guilt and they feel sad because they they have this sense of I'm creating this in them for them to be so aware of me that means I'm scaring them not necessarily true it could be yes possibly that there is a history of uh, the parent turning scary for the child and that's why they're built they have that built up hyper vigilance in terms of reading the parent but many other times, and more times than that, is that the child is looking for cues of safety in you because they will feel as comfortable as you feel. Example, your sensitive child is at the playground and then that child sees a group of kids uh, by the swings. And then the child looks at you, kind of like, is it okay if I go there? Like, and then from your posture, from your body language, from your energy, your child is going to feel, yes, yes, son, yes, daughter, it is safe. You can go and try to enter the group or no, this is scary. So if they sense in us hypervigilance, stress, anxiety, that's what they're going to pick on. Anxiety, the stress, the hypervigilance. So unintended postures that are overpowering, unintended postures that are overly worried. I have to work on that one because that's been my pattern from the way I grew up. My mom, every time something happened, she anxiously came to the scene. What happened? What happened? Are you okay? What happened? What did you do to, Brian, to, to David? David is my brother who has Down syndrome and autism. And in her eyes, I always did something to David. What do you do to David? David, are you okay? So if you have multiple kids and one of them is more vulnerable than the others because your son or daughter has higher needs or because they're more shy or because they, you just see them, they're, they're smaller, younger, weaker, then be aware of how you interact when you enter when you enter the room, when you hear them in the background, maybe having a little conflict or one of them start cry, starts crying and you enter that interaction. If you enter with uh, an anxious energy like my mom did, that it creates a level of lack of safety among the siblings and shame. I grew up feeling that I did something wrong to my to my brother, even if I didn't. And I still have that kind of like sensitivity of me not showing a lot of emotions, 
like big emotions around them because I don't want to hurt them. And it all came from that wound of what happened? What happened? Marcela, what did you do to your brother? <laughs> when in reality, it could have been that, I don't know, he bit his tongue and that's why he's crying, <laughs> you know? So be aware of that. Number three, critical feedback. Do your children can grow up feeling scared of you due to critical fe feedback? Absolutely. Is it that we are raising a snowflake regeneration that has very thin skin because we were able to accept a lot of critical borderline, you know, uh, you know, really traumatic <laughs> kind of feedback from our parents? It's not that we were able to take it on is that we were not allowed to talk about it. We felt hurt, but we did not have the emotional relation, the relationship and the trust to say, hey, this hurt my feelings. So we learned to stuff it down and to grow it inside of us. And right now it's hard for us to even talk about our feelings. So the critical feedback has always been a reason why kids feel hurt by their parents and why kids may grow up feeling scared of the, their parents. And be, since you've been doing gentle parenting, parenting with understanding, respectful parenting, however you want to call it, I know that you are a very aware person. And I want to, to stop there because I know that you've been trying really hard to do things differently. I know that you've been trying really hard to not fall into those kinds of mistakes that the things that your parents told you with your kids. But I have to make you aware of something. Critical feedback, critical feedback is not necessarily as criticizing our kids. Critical feedback could be a lot as beating ourselves up because something we think we did wrong and then that energy is transferred to our kids. Example, let's just say that the, the child is crying and then you have that critical feedback of, my child is crying, there is something wrong, I need to calm him down. And then they don't calm down and you're within your window of tolerance or within the window of time that you thought they could be calming down with you. And then the critical self starts to raise up, tell, telling yourself, they're not calming down with you. What's wrong with you? You're not enough for them. They, you must be doing something wrong. How come they're not calming down with you? You're a bad parent. And then this self-criticism takes us a lot of the times to show up in ways that are not productive for our kids. So this takes us to rushing their calm down process. This takes us to say things such as, oh, it's too much. You've been crying for too long. Just cut it out. Or it takes us to say like, why are you crying so much? And then it the energy that we're transferring to our kids at those moments is an energy of, I, I, I don't know how to help you. And when we communicate that energy of, I don't know how to help you with our kids, it feels really scary for them. If, if you don't know how to help me, then who, who knows? Who's going to be like, if my parent doesn't know how to help me, how am I supposed to know how to help myself? Or how am I supposed to rely on any other person to help me? So critical feedback goes both ways, not just what we tell our kids, but we, what we tell ourselves, because what we tell ourselves is what we end up projecting onto our kids. We work with that with our coaching clients. What are the stories they're telling themselves and how to turn it around so it doesn't transfer onto their kids? People sometimes ask me, what, what is the difference between parenting coaching and therapy? Well, therapy, you are working with a therapist. 
in healing your past wounds. So they stay a lot in your past and then they help you heal. They help you heal. Parenting coaching, we, we are not going to help you heal. <laughs> we leave that to your therapist. But what we do is that we help you rewire the way that you show up to your kids. So those past wounds that you, you have, you know, hopefully don't pass down onto your kids, at least not at the level that could be passing down if there is not a coaching guidance or coaching process, you know. Number four, emotional withdrawal. Emotional withdrawal could be the effect of self-criticism. So let's go back to the example. It's been 10 minutes and she's still not calm, calming down. She's still crying. Marcela, you're doing something wrong. You're a bad mom. You're not enough for her. And then instead of, of me helping me, is not helping me because it could take me to shut down. Why do I even try? So when we enter in the, why do I even try energy? We shut down. And if we shut down, we emotionally withdraw from our kids. And when we emotionally withdraw for our kids, this sends the message to our kids. I have my parents' connection as long as I am calm and regulated. Because when I'm not calm or regulated, they shut down and they withdraw their connection from me. And this is a subconscious process. We don't want to remove our connection from our kids. But it happens because of the stories we're telling yourself, ourselves of why do I even try? So do you see how one thing takes to the other? So the four reasons, the four hidden reasons why sensitive kids could grow up being scared of our of parents are number one, inconsistent reactions. And the way to turn it around is start having consistent reactions to your kids. Number two, unintended postures. Uh, one way, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm recording with my Mac and every time I do the V sign, I just did the V sign with my fingers, balloons go up. It's funny. Unintended postures. So the way we fix this is to check ourselves and say, okay, right now I'm coming up very anxiously to my kids. How can I be a lot more relaxed? I do that all the time because I have a default anxious way of relating to my kids. I grew up with that. So that's what I default into if I'm not aware of it. So when I see myself entering their sibling interactions with what happened, what happened? What did you do to Santi? Santi is my artistic one, you know, instead of that, I'm like, okay, Marcela, I see conflict. I hear conflict. How are you going to choose to show up at this, at this moment? And the way that I show up makes a big difference on their success coming down quicker or later. Number three, critical feedback. Critical feedback, what we tell our kids, what we tell ourselves, because even if we're just telling things to ourselves and not our kids, it ultimately impacts the way that we interact with our kids and the way to turn it around and start being very gentle, not just empathetic and understanding and loving towards our kids, but towards ourselves. You are a good parent. Can you tell yourself right now? Just, just say it. You are a good parent. Say it with your name. Marcela, I am a good parent. You say it with your name right now. I'm going to wait for you. Good. How did that feel? Well, if it felt like, I don't know, like it felt kind of nice, but it felt like I, I was not talking about me. Like it felt outside of me. Like, I don't know if I even believe I'm a good parent is because you've been telling yourself you're a bad parent for such a long time that even saying I'm a good parent sounds very outside of you. So my invitation for you is to, to start saying it more often. You're a good parent. I'm a good parent. I'm a good parent. I'm a good parent. 
And number four, emotional withdrawal. Emotional withdrawal is fixed very simply by surrendering to the moment with our kids. It's not about, and this is something that I work with my coaching clients who come with that very anxious energy of what do I do so my child calms down fast. The goal is not for us to calm our children down or to stop the tantrum or the crying. Our goal is for them to feel as safe as as they can feel through those times. So we are with them in it, not trying to get it, get them out of it because we feel uncomfortable with their big emotions. If these podcast episode of the Parenting with Understanding podcast helped you in some kind of way. Would you leave me a positive review? Just open the description and leave me a positive review. And if you're like Marcel, (laughs) all these things sound great, but I feel like I'm that pendulum parent that goes from reactive to understanding. I don't know how to get out of this pattern. I have a free class that will help you. This free class gives you the system to break free from angry reactions, bring peace to your parenting so you can raise emotionally healthy children, even if your children are neurodivergent or highly sensitive. So if you want to access this class, go to hicparenting.com. I'm going to leave a la card here on top if you're watching us from YouTube or it's in the description on this podcast episode below in the description box. I'm very curious if you're watching me from YouTube, which one of these four things rang the bell for you? Could you please type it right now? That lets me know that you got to this point of this video and it lets me know, it it helps us connect to one another and makes us feel that we are not alone in this parenting journey, parenting highly sensitive and neurodivergent kids. Okay, I want to let you know that it only takes understanding of yourself and of your children's needs to transform your parenting. That's Parenting with Understanding. See you next time. Ciao.